What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Simply C. Let me tell y'all, this is take 22, okay? I hope you had a chance to listen to last week's video on estate planning. This week, we continue that conversation with Judge Mark Stiles. He is giving all kind of good free information on how you can get your estate planning done at a minimum cost. So, check out the video like it subscribe and more than anything as money t would say share 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 so what happens when we don't have a plan for our dependents at the time of our death got it and um estate planning a lot of people when they think of estate planning they think they have to go to a lawyer they think they have to get wills trusts these durable power attorney documents that I talked about, which are very, all very, very important part of your estate planning. But a lot of times estate planning is just simply the way you title your assets. You know, we've all got major assets. Our three major assets are our bank accounts, our cars, and our houses. Those are our three major assets. Mm -hmm. And what has happened um, many a times is that by us failing to understand some of these, and I'll share them with you real quick here, to understand how you can do these little estate planning tricks that most folks know and a lot of just people in our communities just don't know. We end up losing money, um, losing houses, making family members jump through hoops to get access to assets that are very simple. The first I'll start off with bank accounts. Um, and this is free advice. Everybody that's listening, everybody in this room should have a transfer on death, payable on death, POD beneficiary on their bank account. Um, and the reason why is that failure to do that means that if you've got an account that's got five hundred dollars, a thousand, even fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, by not putting that on that account, that means that family member has to go or your family has to go through probate to get access to that bank account. And if it's a five hundred dollar bank account, you know, hey, that's that's good money. You could do mm -hmm. a lot with five hundred bucks. But if the attorney's gonna charge you a thousand, two thousand dollars just to get the paperwork done to get access to that, and then what happens when you've got a blended family, you know, you've raised kids, you want them to have it, or you've got families that uh, are lots of kids, and then this 500 is getting broken down to $25 each. And so that's something that you want to make sure your bank account has a POD payable on death beneficiary. We call that a non-probate transfer because that will allow that asset to go avoid probate. You avoid probate by putting this non-probate transfer, this beneficiary designation on this account, um, the best way to do it is when you open up an account, There's when you do the signature card, it should be a box at the bottom that says POD. If you already opened up the account, you can just ask the uh, bank person, say, hey, I want to add a payable on death beneficiary on this account. They'll give you the signature card. You can just put it right in that box. It's very simple. It doesn't cost a thing, but you saved your family thousands of dollars just by doing that and putting someone's name in there and avoiding probate. Um Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is is TLD and POD the same? And and I and now that was my I, okay. I corrected myself. They are technically the same, but POD and banks do it differently now. You know, we're losing the terminology. But POD payable on death usually deals with bank accounts. TLD usually deals with automobiles. Okay. And so the transfer on death is the same thing. Where you've got a car, and we see it so many times where the family's got a car. Um, dad had five kids but one kid was the one driving the little beat up pickup truck back at work <laughs> and he's getting everything done doing right but when dad dies now five people potentially own this car that's probably worth nothing and he just wants title to it so we can keep going to work but he can't do that because grandpa didn't put transfer on death beneficiary on the car by doing that as soon as he dies, that car is automatically the son's. You don't have to go through probate, do anything. Um, it's a simple way to transfer a really important asset, whether it's worth a lot or a little, to someone else and avoid hiring an attorney and avoid going through probate. And so that's transfer on death for cars, payable on death for bank accounts. And again, free advice. The best time to do the transfer on death is when you renew your tax, um, ask them for a duplicate title. It'll cost you twelve dollars. You got to pay the twelve dollars anyway. So ask for the duplicate title, and then you can put the someone name in that box for transfer on death. And again, that's just a easy way to transfer an asset to someone else. And so we've got yes, ma'am. So is it illegal to have a person if they're already alive to sign the title? 
What do you mean? Oh. <laughs> if you got a title already, can you just sign it? <laughs> to do what? What's the purpose of it? Signing it? You know, if you want to sell it, you know, if you, you know, the space on your title, if you just go ahead and sign it now. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's illegal because I think what you're doing is by signing it, you're just transferring it to them. Right. Yeah. Mm-mm. But mm. you, but you're not. I'm just saying. You're still here. You're still here. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, call the police. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, if you don't have it on the title, you don't have a uh, TOD to this person. You just go ahead and sign. have them sign well, it Well, but you know what that's doing is, and in, in maybe sometimes that's basically, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk about this because that's a good point. Maybe by signing it, now you've made them a joint owner if you're still alive. And so... One thing we talked about DPOAs. And so a DPOA, a durable power attorney is, especially for finances, that person that I named can only take control and handle my assets when I'm disabled. So a payable on death beneficiary, when I put someone's name on a bank account, they can't touch that bank account until I'm deceased. Now, what if I put them as a joint owner? It operates the same way. If I die, that money's there. But there's a lot of negative consequence by putting someone as a joint owner. The big one is, that's my money. I put them in as a joint owner. Well, what if they have a lot of debt? So their debtors now say, hey, you own this account just like Mark Stiles does. Mm -hmm. We can collect Mm -hmm. on that. So now they're collecting on my money just because it's titled that way. Yes. The other thing is it gives someone else the access to re- remove the funds from yes. they, they can remove it just like I could. And so if you trust the person, yeah, it's okay to put them as a joint owner, but it's usually better to do a payable on death beneficiary on your bank accounts because they have no ownership interest until you pass away versus a current ownership interest. And so I think maybe your Good example with the car, they're making themselves as a joint owner versus a beneficiary upon the death of the person. Good information. <laughs> and then our third assets, we've got payable on death, transfer on death. Our third major asset we talked about is real property, our houses. And so the, the original question, what happens with our property when we don't plan? As we know in our communities, our communities are just riddled with houses that are just unkempt. No one lives there. Um, how many houses in these now very expensive neighborhoods that we live in here in Kansas City are now worth tons of money? And if we were able to pass that house down to our heirs, she's got to get out that back, <laughs> pass our, 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 our houses down through our heirs, how much would we have been able to save and really inc- incur a lot of wealth for our families? Uh, we've got whole neighborhoods that are just abandoned homes. And the reason why is because it's not that someone just felt like destroying the house. We know a lot of people that lived in grandpa's house. The grandson's living there. He's taking care of the yard. He's paying the bills. He's living there being a good house ownership, but it's in grandpa's name. And so then when the roof needs to be fixed, he can't get the loan. He can't get the loan to fix the roof because it's still in grandpa's name. He can't get the financing needed to take care of the house so he has to leave and then the house becomes blight in our communities and so the best way to do that and this is i can't give you free advice on this and you do have to go to attorney for this one it's called a beneficiary deed and so a beneficiary deed is just a two-page document if you've got a house it's worth the price because a house is a major asset when i was in private practice i charged maybe four to five hundred dollars just for this two-page document and what it is is when you die that house automatically becomes the person. It's recorded with the recorder of deeds. It automatically becomes the property and ownership of the person that you name as the beneficiary. And so that's just a simple, not a voice probate, non-probate transfer, a way to transfer a major asset to someone else. And it avoids their having to go through probate court, especially when you've got multiple family members that would have this one twelfth interest in his house. Hey, I want to transfer it to this one person. If they want to sell it, fine. If they want to live there, fine. But at least it's transferred correctly to someone else. And they don't have to worry about going through getting an attorney to get proper ownership of this house. Great information. Wow. Yeah, and that's uh, so. You say you used to charge about four to five hundred dollars. So I'm sure other attorneys charge more, but I was I was on the low end. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was wondering if about eight hundred, eighteen hundred was a good price 
to get all of this stuff taken care of? So um, usually, and so an estate plan will usually consist of what we've talked about, and that's doing the non-probate transfers, um, getting in a good attorney will tell you, okay, here's what we'll do for your non-probate transfers. We'll have put, put this person's name on this, put this person's name on that, I'll draft this. And so that's kind of the legal advice that the attorney, he or she will be giving you. They're going to charge you for that, but they'll give you that advice. But then they're going to go to the documents. The documents are going to be the powers of attorney, um, usually one for health, one for financial. The other major document, and this is the cornerstone of every estate plan, is the will. And the will tells the world who your heirs are, what your assets are, and how you want them to be distributed upon your death. Two things, the dual power of attorney, it terminates as soon as you die. Mm -hmm. The will does technically kick in after you die, but one thing that's so important about the wills that many people in our communities don't understand is that you have to probate it for it to be effective. It has to be filed in my court and approved before it's effective. So a lot of people say, oh, I've got a will, I'm good to go. Well, no, it's gotta be, so you still have to have an attorney file it with me, and then I have to approve it and make sure it's a valid will, and then we can distribute pursuant to the will. And so it still has to go to probate in order to be effective. And so, go ahead. So we have a trust mm -hmm. and not a will. Got it. And so a will, the, the one of the main difference between a will and a trust, a will is a, a simpler document than a trust. A will, like I said, it just states who the heirs are, what the assets are, what you want to be done with it. It has to be probated to be effective. A trust can be private. It does not have to go to probate. Trust can remain outside of probate. And what a trust does, and, and I know the listeners can't see it, but you guys can see. And so this, this paper is my trust. And this water bottle is my asset. When you created this trust, you paid money for a pieces of paper. The main thing that people forget about a trust is that I've got to put my asset, my water bottle, into the trust exactly. for it to be effective. Yep. And how do I do that? It's the titling. I get it out of Mark Styles' name and put it in the name of the Mark Living Revocable Trust, trust. whatever trust it is. But that's how I put the asset into the trust. And so then the trust, then now that the asset's written, all this paperwork in the trust is going to say what should happen to this asset if I'm disabled, if I die, um, the how it's, and so it's a more specific plan for what you want to do. And it works a lot. A lot of people don't need trust. Some people do, but it will, it will work upon your disability and it will work upon your death and it's private. It does not have to go to probate. And so therefore people won't necessarily need to know what you are putting and designating to be as your trust property and how it should go out because you may want that information private. A will cannot be private. Once you put it in the probate court, it's open to the world and anybody in the world can see um, what's in your will. Wow. And, and that's one thing when I was look, listening to even being when we were having this conversation is that um, the will is contestable. Right. And yep. the trust is not. not. And that's the, and to that, me, that was a key. And that's not true. Ooh, really? Yeah. And so, Tell me more. <laughs> so a will is definitely contestable. And we have a lot of. Um, that's what he said. The talk. will is contestable. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and, and, and we've had a lot. I don't know who's listening, so I won't talk about that. I'll, I'll just mention it briefly. I don't know if you guys know that Prince, the artist formerly known had Prince had a half brother that lived here in Missouri. And so I just got through dealing with his will contest. And so that was a very large case. It's still going a little bit, but I'm still dealing with that. Trust, the same situation. So I've got another high profile person in the Casey area. Um, they're deceased, but they've kind of helped build up parts of Kansas City. Um, their trust is being contested. And so, and there are so many ways to contest it, and, and I'll give you multiple ways. If I'm a beneficiary of a trust, but the trustee, and so once we put the assets in the trust, there's a person called a trustee mm -hmm. that handles those assets. If I'm a beneficiary, what if I don't feel like the trustee is doing what the document says? I'll sue them. Um, what if I, by me suing them, the trustee says, hey, there's a clause in here. Many trusts have a clause that says, you're not supposed to sue me because if you sue me, here's this clause that says you don't get anything. Mm -hmm. And so then they are litigated and trust litigation has been through the roof. And I'm getting kind of too technical in, in my court. I deal with a lot of trust contests in my court because these beneficiaries don't think that the trustee is doing the right job with their money. 
and with the trust assets. And so when they feel that way, whether they're right or wrong, they can uh, sue the trustee and, do, and, and, and uh, litigate that case. And those cases are very contentious and can be lots. I mean, the judge before me, she did one and it was a 45 day trial. And the so uh, things they can do, you learn on yeah. Let's Talk Money. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's probably some big money. It was. Wow. Yeah. And so that's I don't know. And that's how sometimes misinformation gets out of trust contest or, I open her yeah. totally yeah they 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 do exist trust contests do exist and it's becoming more and more prevalent now as people are not really being aware but so many people did trust and now you're getting them where they're passing away the person that created the trust is gone and now the kids are fighting over what should be happened with the trust or what the assets and it's a big responsibility to be a trustee yes. because you have to manage that property in the best way possible right. and when you don't or someone feels you're not doing it then they can sue you. That's crazy. I had no idea. I had it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It all figured and out. And we get new information. Yeah. I love it. So I just want to ask like a, um, just a personal question. Is there a case that you've had that you consider to be like the hardest decision you've ever had to make? So like a fun fact. <laughs> Yeah, um, the toughest cases are always the ones where, uh, gosh, you know, the pandemic throws you off because since the pandemic has happened, we have still been able to, and I'm required to make sure our court keeps going. Uh, we deal with so many emergencies. And uh, because of that, we've been doing court virtual, a lot of court virtual. I'll still do some in-person court for the really contested matters. But um, a lot of our uncontested cases, we do virtual and we see everybody on like Zoom or what we call it WebEx, but something just like mm -hmm. Zoom and we're able to see each other. But one of the toughest cases I've had, and it doesn't deal with, well, I guess it kind of deals with what we're talking about, is when you see the human aspect of these major decisions we make. I don't know if either of you have seen the, the cartoon called Up. Um, it's a it's Disney Pixar, yeah, and so the it. older man, his his wife dies, and he's getting older. Then he gets these balloons, and he takes his house, and it flows away. Okay, and so it's 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 I'm a really sad. It. It's really sad. So um, it was a case where the gentleman, his wife was deceased, and he kept going to the fire, his, the the close the closest firehouse just to get help or just to talk to them. And, and it was just weird. It was weird. And so they finally went and checked on him and he didn't really have enough food in the house. And the house is a little bit um, disorganized, et cetera, et cetera. So hotlines are made. And so then based on those hotlines, the some social service agency filed for a guardianship and conservatorship for him, basically saying that he's no longer able to take care of his affairs, financial or health, and that someone else needs to do it for him. He had, he had no family and his wife had died. And so, and you know, not see those cases all day, every day. But this one was really tough because he, we come to court. In those cases, we appoint an attorney to represent him to make sure that everything's checking out and give him his due process. And this is one where he was still, a lot of the cases we do those on, the person not able to communicate, they're so disabled, they're still in the hospital, they can't come to court. Um, or they're in agreement with it because they know they have these disabilities. But he came to court. He brought this big binder. He brought all these pictures. He was a former successful businessman. I think he had a business down here in the 18th Vine area. And so he's bringing all these pictures, and he's like, I'm looking at this paper, Judge, and they're saying I'm disabled, but I can take care of myself. But he's not really, but all the evidence show that he could. And so he's in there court crying. He's wanting to show all me his paperwork, the success he's had in life. And so those decisions are tough where it's just like he's close where he's able to do it, but he's not able to. But I, I've got to because when I appoint a guardian conservator, I take away all the rights. You don't have the right to do anything anymore. And I'm giving those rights to somebody else, whether it's a governmental entity or a family member or someone to make them for you. And so and so I'm stripping his rights. But it was tough because he just was so adamant to show me his life story. You know, he brought all these pictures of his life story. Hey. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. How dare they say I need a guardian conservator? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's just like, oh, and it's heartbreaking. I did it. And I said, I've got pictures of Darth Vader in my 
<laughs> my office because I do a lot of stuff with it, but it was tough. And so that was probably one of the most recent tough cases. I mean, you know, it's not a dry eye in the courtroom and he's crying and just doesn't understand why he's there. And, and usually we don't get them where he's so able to talk directly to you and explain his calls, but just he doesn't understand, hey, you don't have food in the house. Hey, the food you have in the house is rotten. Hey, you keep going to the fire department to get help. They keep having to take you to the hospital just to give you your basic needs. Hey, they're about to put you out your house because you haven't been able to um, pay the bills. You're not, you don't even know your mail's just stacking up. You're not doing that. And so those are the tougher cases when you see that human element where Mm -hmm. that disability has come so much where he can't do it and he's not seeing that he has a disability. So those cases are the toughest when they don't see that they need the help and I've got to force it on them and I got to be the bad guy. So those are tough ones. That was a tough one. That was a tough one. Ooh, I know. I feel that. That's sad. It, I wouldn't have a dry eye. I, I know. I, <laughs> like, I know I wouldn't. But you know, I was thinking too, sometimes those people who are appointed actually misuse absolutely those benefits and how do they end back up in court for you to make a Appoint a different person. Or- so let's say I'll use that same gentleman and let's say I appointed his son. I appointed his son as the guardian conservator to handle. So the son, let's say the gentleman had $100,000 in a bank account and income. So I make the son get a bond, almost like insurance, for to cover that 100000 plus all the income. And each year that son is going to report to me what he spent the money on. Um, every penny, every dollar, he's got to give me a mm. detailed Excel spreadsheet okay. on what he's spending the money on. Not only that, he's got to tell me where the person is living. And so we that's that's the supervision. So that's okay. the majority of my work where I'm supervising the son's work. If he wants to sell dad's house, he has to ask me for permission. He can't just go sell it. Uh, if he sells the dad's house, he's got to show me that he sold it for at least 75 percent of what it's worth. And so that's Missouri law kicking in to make sure that I'm supervising him correctly. So let's say, for example, he's like, oh, he, he fails to give me that report or he fails to sell something that he said he was going to sell or fails to do that. Then I'll give him a chance, bring him to court, explain why you did this. And if he doesn't come to court, or explain it correctly. I'll remove him. Then I appoint what we call a public administrator, a third party to come in. And then that third party then is doing all the stuff to make sure the person's getting their health and making sure that their bills are being paid and whatnot. The downside to getting a third party appointment is that we sometimes may want to keep our family in the home and we're going to set things up. We may not be the best. We'll set things up to make sure that they're getting the treatment that they need in the home where when you've got a independent non-family member appointed, they're going to probably put them in a nursing home because it's a little easier, a little easier. They can supervise. And so then that's Mm. where we lose our ability to kind of make the family decisions. And it's, again, our failure to plan. We don't plan Period. and then get that estate plan in place, then, then our failure to plan and leads into results that we can't control. Wow. This has been an awesome conversation and great information. Eye opening conversation. Totally. And the time goes too fast. It does. It does. So, uh, <laughs> Judge, we want to give you a chance to leave any contact information or. Um, and, and and I remember you said that I almost cut you off. I, was like, I, I don't like, so I can't give contact information sure, sure. because I can't. Then they hunt me down. Maybe, hey. maybe your favorite piece of advice. <laughs> like, well, favorite piece of advice. Your final, be, your final nice piece of advice. Other. I mean, be nice. We are coming out of this pandemic. We've been isolated. Uh, we've been separate. And as we come and interact with each other more, the violence is going up. Be nice to each other. We are here to help each other out. I really, I preach unity a lot. I mean, we've got different beliefs, different politics, different ways we grow up, but we've got so much more in common than we believe we do. And so be nice with each other, give each other the benefit of the doubt, and we're all here together. And the more we work together, the better result we can get. Love it. Yes. Well, guys, thank you once again for tuning in to Let's Talk Money. Hey guys, and thank you once again for tuning in to Let's Talk Money. You can find us here every Monday at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. Yes, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be alerted every time new content is aired. Come on, y'all. Tell your mama them, your cousin them, all of them. Tell them all. Tell them to subscribe and listen to Let's Talk Money. Yes, and be sure to leave us some comments. Chat with us. We'll be chatting live at times, so chat with us. Hey, remember, your money's mindset matters. 
Mike. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Peace, y'all. Peace.